you know? Yep. So it's interesting, but I'm just saying. You know, because, like, you know, I'm a past physicist. Singularity is like a delta function, man. You know, it doesn't have much width. It's a, it like happens. Bang. Is, it, is it like the eye of the needle thing? Oh, I don't know. I, I, it's an interesting term. I don't know how to think about it, uh, you know, using other concepts from other domains. It might not be relevant. We're talking about the singularity <laughs> briefly because Bill was struck by doug b's comment in the last <clears throat> thursday's call that we are now passing through the singularity I, this... I like to say that we've been been in it for a while um about a couple thousand years a couple thousand yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's an it's... event horizon it you know you can't feel it until all of a sudden you really feel it hmm. are we going to dematerialize and rematerialize on the other side at some point nope good how would you know? <laughs> I'm happy with a definitive nope. <laughs> no, see? <laughs> well, the weird thing is, the weird thing, even now, people don't really have an understanding of what they're living in. We think, I mean, we think the world is, hasn't changed much, um, but, you know, there's big things that happen that, that we can't really see because we're individual humans. And it's going to keep being like that. So in uh, 50 years, it's going to be like, well, well, we're still just human, right? I'm so glad you didn't phrase that. Go ahead. The example I have of this is uh, from John Perry Barlow uh, 20 years ago or so. He wrote, a, um, uh, he wrote an essay for Wired magazine. Um, and it was, he, he, he basically talked about his, I think his mom or his grandmother uh, living through, you know, in, in, in Montana or something like that, living from... The frontier days, you know, into the age of airplanes and, and weird stuff like that, right? So he kind of imagined himself like that. And then he came up with this concept called humanity itself, uh, capital H, capital I. Um, there's a driving force that he feels like humanity it has um, that's separate from individual humans um, and gives us things like communi telecommunications and stuff like that. It seems like there's a path where humanity itself is tracking stuff that individual humans don't. So he said, it's kind of like individual humans are like mitochondria in a human body. Um, you know, uh, mitochondria got sucked into cells, you know, millions of years ago and, and mitochondria kind of still do their mitochondrial thing. You know, they're just hanging out and chilling, doing their stuff. And they don't realize that a human has got this whole like existence and plans and, 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 and things like that, that, you know, have nothing to do with mitochondrial uh, desires or needs or wants or anything like that. So I, I've always been struck by that, that scale comparison. I think it's a good one. But there have been periods where we have collectively adjusted uh, much faster um, than, uh, than, than you would, you would uh, assume possible. I mean, think about World War II mobilization. Think about the introduction of the iPhone. You know how fast uh, we have taken to uh, to technology advances over the last thirty years, even in our own lifetime. I mean, stuff we take for granted right now, sitting here on a Zoom call, would have been science fiction twenty years ago, ten years ago. And and what's what's that a signal for you? Of is it acceleration or? humans coping with acceleration or what it what it tells me is that there is a capacity that we may not know how to tap into um there's a there's a positive way of tapping into it through the advance of technology that's simply attractive and makes things better or uh, there is uh, uh, advancement because of a urgent need, such as a war, you know, and and uh, and an existential threat. So, so the um, thanks for me. Uh, the illustration there in World War II is a really good one. Um, uh, humans couldn't stand and say, "Let's not have World War II," and they just came off World War One, right? So it's not like they didn't know what was going to happen if they had a world war. But they were, it was inevitable. It was a larger than human and larger than human 
groups um, thing that happened. Uh, humans did an interesting job kind of keeping up the pace, but they were powerless to stop what happened. And, and it was bigger than, you know, anybody could. So climate change is the same thing, right? It's like you get one person, a hundred people, a thousand people, 10,000 people, you can get a hundred thousand people saying, Hey, we don't want climate change. Let's just stop it. Kind of in the same way that we, you know, could have said that about World War II and that's not enough people. It's not a big enough um, uh, organism to say, hey, let's change our change the way we do this. While I'm clearly fond of this subject and we could go on this way for quite a while, um, <laughs> I think we're here for the books. I think we're here for some neo books, and I don't think everybody can be here for that long. Uh, so why don't we do a little neo books business, and then should we have the appetite, we can head back into singularitizing or not. Um, Pete, do you want to summarize what the work you and I did on thinking about Ghost versus Substack and setting up a separate account, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and yes, where, do you think, I, where do you think that is? I would love to. Thanks. Um, and uh, if I may, can I take the opportunity to also talk about kind of what NeoBooks might want to be doing in a larger sense? I would love <clears> that. Um. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I, I think, so, uh, NeoBooks is kind of Jerry's idea, Jerry's, um, Jerry's promulgation, uh, to keep moving forward, uh, to have something, uh, a way of expressing, well, actually capturing, collating, collecting information, um, uh, making a, a, a good artifact out of it, but not an artifact like an old book, an artifact like a new book, a NeoBook. So, um, into that space of possibility, um, a few of us, especially Jerry, um, but a few of the rest of us have talked about what a neo book is, what it could do, you know, how it might be. So um, one of the things that we got to was we didn't, we didn't have any traction. We didn't know what to do because we weren't doing anything. So uh, we came up with the idea of a, um, uh, it was called a quick first book. Um, I don't know if it was uh, ended up being quick, um, and and it was much larger and denser and richer, I think, than we thought it would be. Um, but Klaus uh, did most of the work of writing um, that first book for Neo Books. So now we have the opportunity of going, okay, so if we had uh, such a, 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 a concentration of information and knowledge, what would we, what are the next steps? So coming from the other direction, um, partly because of the name, partly because Jerry and I have been talking about this stuff for probably decades. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think I think it's clear that old style books. The way I said it once is is books are where information goes to die um, because it kind of ends up on a shelf and it's hard to access. It's hard to search. It's hard to search a thousand books or ten thousand books all at once. So now we have this thing called the web, and it's got its own mass, but. There's something in between, you know, there's some kind of concentration like a book and something that's kind of webby and, and, uh, and graph based and, you know, uh, information space ish and uh, can be searched and things like that. That's where a neo book lives. It seems to me that we need um, I, to, to honor the name kind of for me, it's like, it seems like there should be a a neo book team or something like that, or teams, maybe there can be a multiple teams doing neo books, but the neo book team is kind of in charge of the whole pipeline of stuff, um, uh, helping the material get collected and written at one end and helping the, the information get, you know, sorted, searched, retrieved and consumed at the other end. So if the information isn't being consumed, um, and hasn't gone through a publishing process, a, kind of an editorial process to make it something that makes sense to people. We haven't done our whole job as a new book team. And so we're, we're fighting to kind of figure out what the next steps are um, uh, emergently kind of, you know, so we're to the point in the, the pig in the Python is like, we've got a, you know, the beginnings of a published book um, we've got the finished of a written book. We've got the beginnings of a published book. What are the next steps? So I'm looking for something that kind of documents and, and illuminates that whole process. 
um, and and to see where I can fit in and where other people might fit in. So that's kind of the context for me. Um, one of the things that we identified last week was a good leading edge to that, that process of publication is starting to take pieces of the book um, or things about the book. You know, here's a great book about this. Um, you should read it because of these things, because of singularity and climate change or whatever. Um, uh, we should take parts of the book and things about the book and make blog posts out of them, except in 2023, the way you make blog posts uh, is with a new slash old school tool called an email newsletter platform. So an email newsletter platform is like Substack um, or like Ghost. Um, uh, so if I'm, if I'm a Substack author or a Ghost author, the interface to me looks like an old school blog um, system. I go and write my post. It's got a, a thing that old school blogs doesn't don't have. It, it's also got a subscriber list, so I can go to my subscriber list, and I can usually I can pick you know which tiers. Um, the bronze tier um, only paid for uh, once a month updates. The silver tier gets most of the updates, and the gold tier gets every updates and some extra stuff. Um, so implicit in there is also kind of the idea that there's payment that can be associated with being a member of one of these emails, uh, email newsletter platform list things. So um, when last we spoke, uh, I was talking about the difference between Substack and Ghost. Substack is kind of uh, the, the new hotness. Um, it's very popular. Um, it's growing by leaps and bounds. Um, it's an awesome and wonderful tool. It does lots of things like get you more distribution for your content and things like that. Distribution in this sense, meaning more eyeballs on your stuff. Um, uh, so, uh, so one of the, the, a very small example of this, um, uh, is, uh, recently I'm, I'm subscribed to, I don't know, like a dozen sub stacks or something like that. One of them said, um, uh, Hey Pete. <laughs> There's a bit of a technical detail here, which I'm going to have to go into a little bit. Um, it said, hey, Pete, we've noticed you haven't been opening your, your emails from this list. Um, and if you want to keep getting it, we don't want to like bug you or anything like that. So if you want to keep getting it, you know, click here and tell us that you're still interested in it. Turns out the reason that um, they can't tell if I open my emails is because I don't, I never, I have my email system set up to never load images. Um, Im loading images is the way that um, web bugs uh, tell the person who sent the email that you've actually opened it. So I don't like that. It, and um, so I have it turned off. Um, most, some people do that, most people don't. Um, so, so anyway, it said, you know, hey, you should like uh, come uh, click on this, go to the Substack, tell us you're still interested in getting this, this uh, newsletter, everything would be wonderful. And I was still interested, so I did click the thing um, and it said, great, you know, you're, you're resubscribed to this email list, you'll keep getting it, um, even if you're not opening it for whatever reason. So right then, um, they said the author of that, that newsletter also likes these other newsletters, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, they have little check boxes next to them. I, there's a select all button. It's, and below that, it says subscribe for free. So that's a classic Substack thing. And they, they, they do these interactions all over their, their product where they've got, they've got you by the lapels because you're reading their stuff. And they say, here, here is even more stuff. Except that the way they do it is very, very clean. It doesn't feel smarmy. It, it feels like I'm getting something. They're giving me something. It's just wonderful. So that's the good news about Substack. The bad news is they're using all of that engagement stuff in the way that, to use a really dirty name, uh, in the way that Facebook does to get more, more people using their platform. They don't care so much if I'm getting value out of it. They care a lot more that they're getting value out of it. So I went through, um, sorry for all the detail on Substack, but it's, I think it's a good example of their, their engagement stuff. It's a, it's a win for me in that I get more information and content that I love. It's a win for them that they get me deeper involved in their platform and they can end up monetizing my eyeballs better for their, their customers. So make no mistake, Substack is not in the, con in the content 
distribution business, they're in the eyeball aggregation business on behalf of their their people. So Substack is, you know, it's it's one of the the kind of forces that we I, that we rail against a little bit. Uh, they they're doing concentration, they're doing commercialization, they're doing a little bit of of capture and hold. Um, it's it feels a lot better than Facebook. I don't know if it is or not. So then they've got a competitor, Ghost. Uh, Ghost has got a very similar product, and in some ways it's actually better. Ghost does a really lousy job of doing that cross promotion. Um, it it doesn't do the same kind of. They're they're not in it for the. Um, they're they're actually in it. Their Ghost customers are the people paying them ten bucks a month to host a Ghost site, and that's who they serve. So they they serve the authors. They don't serve a business that's trying to make as much money as it can. Um, so Ghost is cuter and, and their business model is simpler and they're not so rapacious. Um, they're not, um, uh, they're, they're not whatever, kind of the, the, uh, the I'm gonna say Silicon Valley assholes. I don't know if the Substack people are Silicon Valley or New York or what, they're probably neither, but um, they're, they're capitalists. Uh, ghosts are not they're, obviously they're they're in a capitalist system but they're much less so they, they care a lot more about community they care a lot more about open source um i have free ghost account and a, or i sorry i, I self-host a ghost instance and i also have a ghost account where i pay the money they're happy that i'm using their software with for free and everything is wonderful so um jerry and i kind of went through this probably in less detail <laughs> on friday <laughs> um and I was arguing hard that I wish we didn't have to sign up with Substack. Substack seems like the right choice because they, they're going to get us more eyeballs, which is what we kind of want for NeoBooks. Um, even in spite of the fact that they're kind of counter, counter, counter brand, they're off message for us. Um, where we came to was that neither Ghost nor Substack is really the right architecture for this. And um, several of us have been thinking about a better email newsletter architecture. Um, it's actually kind of, you could take massive wiki and if you bolt it on uh, email sending and maybe a few more things, you'd actually get a real nice newsletter platform like Ghost or like Substack, um, but with better features uh, and even more of a community oriented thing. So Jerry and I decided that's where we want to go. Um, we'll write up that architectural vision. Um, we'll work towards that uh, as the Neo Books team. Um, and in the meantime, we're just going to sign up with Substack and um, bite the bullet and get eyeballs. Um, another com another significant component of this is the entry business model for Ghost and Substack. Ghost has made a terrible mistake where if I want to use Ghost, um, pretty much I have to pay them 10 bucks a month between nine and 11. Um, if I want to use Substack, Substack is rich and fat already, so they don't need my money up front. They're totally happy for me to engage for, how, for however long it takes for me to decide that I'm going to drive revenue through them, and then they're going to take a 10% cut. So, um, so for us uh, who don't have a lot of money lying around for this this project, Substack is like a clear and easy winner for the first you know the first six months, a year, two years, something like that. Ghost is a much harder sell. Um, somebody's going to have to fork up you know ten bucks a month. So that's I, I'm I'm sorry to say that's another component of the decision to to go with Substack uh, to begin with. Um. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. To build on um, Pete's description and connect it back to NeoBooks a bit, the reason we were inspired to go do a Substack or a Ghost or some kind of newsletter, which has sort of replaced blogging, we that's a different conversation, but it seems like blogs now kind of live on Substack uh, in the general public's mind, uh, was that we could find a way to get uh, crowdsource critiques of nuggets of content that are going into NeoBooks by posting them as if they were blog posts or newsletter episodes through the Substack. And we might actually do that intermingling the different books. So let's let's say that there's four authors working NeoBooks through the, through the system. Um, I think I, I, I had mentioned that it would be great if the header to 
um, our Substack pub explained this and said, for more details, just go read this post over here. But that each post would say, this is for this neo book over here, and this is working chapter two or whatever, like, and have a go with it. But Klaus, that would give you published nuggets that you could forward to anybody, point to anybody. They would look pretty good. They would look like a good a blog post. <clears throat> um, and I think that one of the things that's really struck me is that as we've gone through the process of you and ChatGPT collaborating on writing this book, um, you've been really happy because a lot of the pieces that come out of that interplay are useful to you in your interactions with other people whom you're trying to like in influence or share knowledge with or whatever else. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would have to become familiar with the technology, obviously, but it sounds pretty straight up. So I think I think what this means is we end up um, creating a new Substack account that has share where we share the ID and password, and um, uh, I think that's pretty doable. I don't know whether Substack is would be mad if we were using the you know the same account on three different machines concurrently. I don't know if it notices or cares. Um, Should be fine. Okay. Um, and then we would each uh, learn to compose a, a post or a newsletter and probably confer with each other and in, in, in the Neobooks channel and say, hey, I'm about to send out a chapter. What do you, you know, all clear and go for it that way. And and we'll just figure out our protocol about uh, what that all looks like. And I, I'm happy to write up a, a little short checklist that includes reminders of how to use Substack. I think we'll need a little bit of instruction thing. Damn you, Sonoma. Um <laughs> Uh, and, and also, uh, well, I like this one. This is my favorite of all the hand gestures. <clears throat> <laughs> You're getting really fancy here. The laser, the laser light show rocks, man. Um, but that would have, um, tips on how to use Substack, And then also, Hey, did you, did you put a header on that says, this is this book? Did you this, did you this? And if we can sort of make sure we've checked those items, we're kind of good to go. Other thoughts, questions. I think that's that's all the that's all the explanation we need right this second to cover Substack. I think there's still another really interesting conversation about the future of massive wiki relative to neobooks, relative to how the world looks at information, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to have that conversation right now, but I, that's a conversation I'm excited about and want to create some media around, like uh, with Pete and yeah. anybody else and anybody else who wants to. Well, thank you for doing for doing all that research here and getting us. Uh getting us more forward um i've i've got a wish and we could maybe keep it for the later in the call or something like that so if, if people want to drop off they can i've got a wish that we actually get substack uh, up and going um on this call so that it's done right and um and at least with a few people uh especially you and me jerry uh you know to answer the right questions and things like that um, for, by the way, uh, they, um, uh, a Substack can have, uh, team members. Oh, good. Uh, so we don't need to share the account. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. So we don't need to share, uh, ID and password. We just each need to have a login to it. Uh, yes. That makes total sense because so many people write multi-party web blogs, basically, or multi-party newsletters using it. So that makes total sense. Thank you. I, I have not been behind the curtain on Substack yet, so. And um, you can, and uh, well, not that this, um, uh, you can either be known to the public or not known. To, you can be public staff or, or um, secret staff, and then right. you can have different roles, admin, contributor, or byline. That's awesome. If I could just uh, chime in here briefly, because I have to go at the top of the hour, but uh, I, I'm... Uh, um, I've been using Substack anyway, and I, I, I want to share something here, which um, I've been playing around with. So I've shared Jerry uh, some of his materials, which he's, uh, we, we can talk some other time about your opinion about it. Um, but the idea behind it is to actually engage people in the first part of a blog post, finding a question that they feel that they would like to speak to. But the second part actually is eliciting people's personal stories about uh, what they what their own personal experiences have been of inequities. Uh, it goes into more detail there, but uh, I, I've, I've already just started 
doing a, a monthly Zoom call on this where I interview people, but I have a conversation beforehand to set it up. There's a methodology for setting up, have an interview that goes on for maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then there's a uh, generative dialogue about the story that was told by the person. So it's a very personalized uh, approach. And it gets into um, your, you know, your own family of origin, personal, you know, um, professional origin of story, whatever, whatever experience that you have that you would like to share about um, how you've experienced some inequity and how you managed to work around it. So, anyway, conversation to be continued. Hopefully, I'll be here next week to to chat, and I'll see if I can watch the end part of this conversation to find out where it's developing. But Last time I was here two weeks ago, I really appreciated the idea of something being a living book that's iterative, dynamic, and engages people. And the story, and you rewrite your story, et cetera, et cetera. It's how do you create that sort of uh, learning milieu that we so sorely need. Anyway, that's my, that's me off my soapbox. Okay. Love that. Thanks, Rick. All righty. Okay. Take care now. All right. Um, what, what else should we talk about before, um, putting on the leather apron and, uh, pulling out the, 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 the ads and the, uh, the shapers. Um, I, I think what are the next steps with Klaus's book? Um, uh, Bill's, Bill's had a pretty good read over it. Um, I've had less of a good read over it, I guess. Um, and and we could push it out the door as it is, um, or we could uh, do other work on it. And I so I it, guess putting that yeah. kind of in the context of, you know, who's doing all, where, when, how, for how much. I think we haven't had a tour of does this smell like a book and what would make it like feel like a book. So I think that Bill's comments and uh, maybe there's a, a, like, there were four people who volunteered. And I have not been in good touch with all of them. So I need to like say, hey, has anybody else got any thoughts or opinions and offer them a way to feed those back in? But I think uh, not an exhaustive round of everything, but uh, but but clearly a how, what would it take to make this into more of a book uh, is kind of useful right now. And then and then Klaus, I think maybe since we're setting up the sub stack now, maybe the next step is to choose which chapter or nugget doesn't have to be a full chapter. It can be any piece of it to start uh, publishing through Substack as a test drive, and then see what it, see what attention we can kick up with that. Well, because I think once once you publish it, we can all re, you know retweet it. I I can't say retweet anymore because I'm I haven't like touched Twitter for a long time, and I don't know. My soul hurts because <clears throat> because I don't have a, the old medium I used to have. Hey Stuart, good to see you. Stuart, you look different. There is something new about you. <laughs> his hair is combed my back. Hair is, my hair is slicked back. That's all. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 He combed his hair today. So. That's all. <laughs> That's it. That's, That's it. all. <laughs> We're, um, we just had a really nice conversation about Substack and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, uh, Pete is ready to go set up a Substack for us. Uh, I don't remember if you were in part of the call previously here about how we might use it. But the idea is that writers of Neobooks might post some of their nuggets through the Substack as blog posts or newsletter episodes, which are sort of inter interchangeable terms or parts these days, I guess. Um, and then we'll see if we can drum up some, some attention for those posts as a way of crowdsourcing some editing and feedback and also previewing and building attention for a Neobook. Um, and okay. you know th those posts could also have a link in the footer or whatever that says, hey, this this is a, a neo book. Here's where to go find out what a neo book means. I yeah. would love to hear from Bill what uh, what your observations are. Okay, I, I was here for for um, that it hadn't been solidified yet. But what's what's interesting to me is that, and I still keep it close. But very early on, um, when blogging and um, and tweeting um, surfaced, uh, one of the early um, activists in that arena actually took my first book and annotated it, <laughs> half of it, blog, tweet, blog, tweet, blog, tweet, 
So, you know, what I just really want to do is kind of validate that um, if you write something of value, there are tons and tons of nuggets in there. Tons and tons. Cool. Which book, which book could they, which book they do do that too? Getting to resolution. resolution. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still have all of the, all of the door dog ear pages and the tweets and the blogs and the da, 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 da. and every once in a while I'll I'll get a little enthusiastic and I'll start posting stuff. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a great idea, and appreciate that, Pete. Mm -hmm. uh, other thoughts, questions. Um, Bill's reactions. As, oh, as yeah. Bill, do you want to dive in? I mean, that's yes, that's, that's yes, no, maybe, yes, I do. That's, I do. That's going to maybe eat the rest of our time on the call. I think. No, I don't think no? so. Okay. I mean, well, it could, but I don't think so. Okay. Um. So first, it's pretty impressive what you put together. I have to say, Klaus, I was really like, whew, all righty. So I basically looked through the main big pieces. I didn't read all of the chat GPT generated text that you did. I just skimmed through much of it to just see the main topics. Um, I did a deep dive for myself on the spiral dynamics since it was somewhat new to me. Um, it took me way back into <laughs> psychoanalysis of work groups, um, which was pretty interesting. Um, and uh, and Theory U, which I just knew a little bit of, and I looked at that more. Um, and I had a conversation with Pete, but what it seems to me, what you put together so far, to me, is like three books. Mm -hmm. There's this story of soil, what, you know, the, this, the soil-focused kind of context here. Let's talk about things this way. And with the water cycles, and, you know, there's a ongoing because I've looked into it a little bit, um, there's some ongoing back and forth about water cycles, climate models, what's taken into account, what's not taken into account, how the models actually work in terms of how they divide up the atmosphere. And, you know, it gets can get complicated in the atmospheric chemistry world, which I have a little background in. Um, and then there's the piece about spiral dynamics and understanding how one can use that to enable communication, which I think was how you presented it. It was like, here it is. And if we want to try and have better conversations, maybe we could identify, you know, some of our, you know, how we walk in the room and use that to, you know, maybe you know, be better at be better at trying to rather than just saying the same thing over louder. The people who you know aren't listening that way um and then the theory you think i think is very interesting i will say as a you know as a former practicing zen buddhist the whole presencing thing is kind of <laughs> i liked it but you know um so there is like three pieces there um and so i for me i think they're all kind of important but they have three different um uh, aims so when you put this all together as a story of soil, I was a little confused, like, what is this collection for? Whom do you see actually using it? And in what way? And I saw myself, I mean, I got a lot out of reading this stuff and saying, huh, I'd like to know more about spiral dynamics. Let me go. But that's partly me. I mean, I'm willing to spend the time to do that. Anyway, so I saw that, it, that, that's how I took away the first big piece I saw. So if this was going to be put together as a Neo book, it might be, you know, you know, we put together the first triad, you know, so like, you know, Star Wars. The first three movies are about blah, and here we go. And what somehow set a context for there's information, we need to communicate with people. We all communicate differently. We often disagree. We often don't listen. You know, and then there is this, you know, this theory about how do we come from wherever we are to get to some place that might be different in, in a productive way, right? I mean, yeah. so that's how I see that as there's three things, not just one. And I think they're all important. 
Um, and I have a little bit of your own concern because I looked into some of the climate science recently with this recent, uh, oh, there's a recent summary about how uh, oh, the whole temperature thing is, well, there was a scientist who wrote this sort of general summary and saying, well, it's not all about thermodynamics. It's about other kinds of dynamics, you know, so I'm a thermodynamicist. They said, yeah, you're not helping us. What are we talking about? I mean, if I'm just an ordinary citizen, okay. We saw the word dynamics twice, but it's different, you know. So it, in a way, what you said, it was overly complicated. Um, you know, it could be like Pete support this up, but it could be a matter of scale because, you know, we're not going to say, you know, you know, we could say like thermodynamics is about, you know, as about heat and the movement of heat. There are other things happening in addition. Heat is, you know, and you don't want to be reductive, right? Because you say, well, you know, in the end, it's just, you know, heat is the, you know, describes everything in the universe. It's like, well, when we're done talking, we might as well, you know, there's nothing to do with that information at that level. Anyway, so I, I don't know how, so I think the path you're on is really generative for me. And I just, uh, I mean, that was my response as to what I looked at. Uh, a question for you, Bill, um, before we go to class. Um, are you saying, A, these are three different books that are kind of unrelated, uh, B, the, the, I could see how this could be a book, but it isn't tied together to be a book yet, or E, or, or, or C, something entirely different? Because um, I, th I, I think, think I think, I think it's B and A. It is a book because Klaus declared it to be here, three things together. And they are related in the way he's sort of organized it. I think it needs a better context for just an ordinary reader who hasn't just stumbles on it to see what am I getting into here, right? And I see they are connected because, I mean, when I listen to Klaus, I mean, not only is there all this information about, you know, like regenerative agriculture and trying to actually, you know, find a way to live more productively on the planet rather than destructively. And then we do have communication problems big time. And also, it's not clear that, it's not clear we, we don't, well, this we don't necessarily agree on how to go about getting from a confused mess into a productive action. And I think the theory you think tries to take some of Represent something about that as a way to, you know, for me, it's like, oh, here's a way to think about it. And maybe you could use this in your own behaviors with others and move, you know, take some, take some st steps that are positive. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as being, it needs uh, just a little, I guess if I were the reader, I would say, here's Klaus, here's, you know, here's one way to read this, this, this book. That has these three sections, you know, and Klaus to say, here's how I tie them together. Here is, I think, an effective word. You know, I've read books like this. The author says, this is a, you know, this is one way to read my book, blah, 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 blah. And I don't think it's, that's perfectly good information for the reader because they're just looking at <laughs> words and punctuation and they're like trying to make sense out of it. Hmm. Klaus, your thoughts? Yeah, so the the logic that I was um, trying to apply here is, first of all, to bring attention to the importance of soil, the historic context, you know, where soil um, um, has uh, maintained and ended civilizations throughout our history, um, the importance of soil in relation to water, now the the um, hydrologic cycle that I didn't even know what that word was <laughs> six months ago, and and uh, um, and so and so how how all that is linked together and how we need to really farm, not to sequester carbon, which has sort of become a theme, but to restore the soil microbiome back to health. So there is this one chapter that that puts in a historic perspective the amazing importance of soil. As, as the foundation of life, um, 
and uh, and the impact of the soil water connection to uh, to climate change and in the process we discovered that most climate models missed the hydrologic cycle you know and and uh, um and completely underestimated the impact that water has you know, on on the acceleration of climate of a changing climate the second part is where i wanted to use spiral dynamics to explain that people have different capacities to listen so so for example right now we have mike johnson just became speaker of the house the guy's bright blue but in the blue spectrum you can't explain science because god is in charge right i mean you 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 talk to someone in the blue spectrum about uh no we, we are losing uh, the battle uh maintaining an, a, a functioning biosphere and that just doesn't resonate at all because it's it's a uh, it's a thing for for the gods <clears throat> and then in the red spectrum it's even worse you know that's where the trump lives and uh, so, so so then you have the orange spectrum where it's all about business and uh you know how much money can i make here and then the green spectrum and so, and so i wanted to explain that people listen differently based on their um first of all capacity of their uh of their consciousness you know the the uh, uh so that you have to tailor messages uh, to to the uh, to be audience specific and in the third part, the the power of theory U is that we identify a problem and we start debating solutions. That's the typical response, right? When you uh, when you suggest an idea uh, to to uh, to someone, they will instantly know that this can't be done because or have a solution and so on. So theory U is really a process uh, structure. It's a it's a social systems project management tool, you know, where you help uh, uh, people uh, to get through, you know, the iceberg model to go through a process of exploration, aligning of uh, understanding and 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 knowing until reach until we reach a collective uh, 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 state of presencing where we're all on the same page. We got it. We understand. You know what the issues are, what needs to be fixed, and we also have an idea of where we want to go, but what what the what the desired outcome is, and then from there you move into a phase of crystallization. You know, the, the pulling the information really tightly together, and then experimentation, which is referred to as prototyping. So in this fourth uh, episode now, where I'm starting volume two. That's where uh, I'm focusing on learning from the future as it wants to emerge, because we can't we can't determine an outcome uh, in any fixed way. What theory you actually proposes, what Odo Sharma is proposing, is don't define an outcome uh, by more than 50, 60 percent. You know, you have an idea of where. We need to go what we need to achieve, but you don't know yet the obstacle course that you have to get through in order to reach that. So uh, you 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 define a desired outcome uh, to the point where it has structure, it, it has uh, meaning, uh, it's generally understood, but then the path is an exploration as you move through uh, the, the way forward. So that's where I'm where I'm at now. Uh, with, the, with this volume too. So uh, hopefully that makes sense to connect the, the story. Um, Pete, please. Thanks, Stuart. Um, loving this conversation, by the way. Um, I have I have kind of, I, I don't mean this to be a provocative question, uh, but I, I wonder if it will be provocative. Um, what kind of readership are we looking for? Um, for for Klaus's book. Um, so in the first month, are we happy with one reader, 20 readers, uh, a thousand readers? Mm -hmm. And like maybe after a year, uh, how many people do we hope, hope will have read this? It's a hard book to read. You know, you have to, 
I mean, you have to have a um, a certain mindset before you can even get into it. Um, uh, and even then, it's not easy to digest, which is why you now we're talking about taking nuggets out of it. So Poss a possible way of answering it. Nobody from a particular tier of the spiral dynamics model. So like orange people aren't going to go, oh, here's the book for me. I need to read this. Um, this book is a meta book because it's about how to communicate with people at all different levels about this big thorny problem. So maybe the audience for this book is narrow and specific about change makers who understand systems thinking and some degree of spiral dynamics or are willing to listen to uh, interesting approaches to how to solve those problems. And maybe we need to define the, that group of people narrowly and then find them when the book is done, go out and actually like locate, locate a bunch of them and say, hey, could you pass this to all your friends? <clears throat> what, however that works. Because the book as currently set is not a general readership publication. Uh, it's not even uh, like the dawn of everything, a thorny read for people who want to fix the world, it, it, it's it's sort of not that either because it because it goes so specifically into particular methodologies, which is terrific. Like books sometimes are very focused, but Klaus, I think what Pete is asking you to do is, could you just put some walls around or some uh, a little bit of fencing around who those people are who realistically would like to read this whole book? There's a bunch of other people who will read the blog posts and forward them and like them, but the, if this is to be treated as a book. Who, who do you think is going to read the whole book and find it useful? David, maybe you can help me out here. Is this a book that would resonate within the GRC community? Um, I haven't read. I What I did was kind of, and I'm sorry to come in late. I kind of, the first thing I did was took the book and created the table of contents. And I couldn't follow the table of contents. And that to me was kind of a test of the coherence of the book. So it sounds like you've been explaining the bits that I needed explained. So sorry, I missed that. Um, and my, you know, the GRC people, there are, might be some, I mean, so one thing is I've, I've been working with a friend of mine who's put out a book how to, on how to uh, do, um, uh, how boomers should deal with climate change. So you can look it up on Amazon. Lawrence McDonald is a really good writer. His table of contents is really good, by the way. So I think it might be worth just looking at this table of contents to get a feel for it. Because he kind of gives the chapter title and then he gives the actions, the title, actions, title, actions. It's all there on one page. Um, but he's talking about, he's got a real publisher. He's like dreaming that he can get 10,000 people to, to, to read the book. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't, and I assume hundreds is much more the accepted norm for a published book. And so anyway, I just think our expectations of book is probably way overblown. Um, I wondered if this book could be a textbook, but then you would need a course, right? If you were teaching the book in a tech, in a course, that might make a lot of sense. And of course, you can always force your students to buy the book. I, uh, uh, um, th thanks for the, the idea of the wall, Jerry. I, I actually, I don't have an expectation. Um, it may be that Klaus got you know, for the whole planet, Klaus got what he needed out of just writing the book um, and structuring his ideas. And and um, now I think this is a beautiful thing, not a weird thing, but, uh, and, and now maybe it'll be like a, a whale carcass on the bottom of the ocean, you know, in, enriching a whole uh, ecosystem of um, uh, plants and animals and, and, and people feeding off of that. Um, maybe that's good enough. I, or, you know, or if, if we wanted, you know, 10,000, like Dave, Dave, Dave said, 10,000 is a lot when you're talking about a book. If you wanted 10,000 people to read or at least be exposed to the top three ideas out of it, you know, that's something that you could drive for. Uh, you could say, okay, let's, you know, let's make that table of contents and then make a little summary thing and then pick the top three things and then blast those, those out over um, X and you know whatever else Instagram and TikTok and whatever and you would get ten thousand people to see the top three things for this book you know and you might get one or two people to actually read more of it and so that's a different way completely different way to do it right um, 
just you know just kind of wonder what what we care to aim for um what we're happy with what we what we would be happy with in a year um and then you know let's work on that whatever it is I, and i don't care too much what it is and i'm not hell bent to turn this into a book book that goes to kindle direct or whatever and all that i want to do that with one of the neo books that's sort of in the queue that would be great but Klaus, don't don't feel like my life will be saddened and I will be disappointed if that doesn't happen. I'm interested in this doing the best work for you and for the movement and for helping humans that, that it can, the way Pete just described. Um, so I'm, I'm good for that. Um, I think we should explore what the sort of different angles and methods are. And also it feels like every rev we do where we try to do something like we're doing right now, we get some clarity that we didn't have like before the call. And that's, I think that's good for what we're up to as well. Um, Stuart. Yeah, a few, uh, just a few somewhat disjointed thoughts. Um, to speak to the somewhat disjointed conversation, although it is, it is, a, it is a congruent whole. But I have some vague recollection that um, that the point that Bill raised about not being sure where we were and that Klaus then did an exposition on to explain, I, I think I, I suggested something like that as being needed at the beginning of the book to provide context, that that was kind of <laughs> missing as a, as a, as a um, you know, as a, as a piece of wilderness guidance. Um, that's one piece. Second piece, you know, um, when David started talking about um, table of contents, table of contents is a marketing document. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marketing document. Um, I love the idea or the, the image of the, of of the of the quote book being a carcass at the bottom of the ocean that maybe grabs a certain number of people. And 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 yeah, when you're first doing a book, I think, um, you know, you need to do it because it's something that you feel compelled to say. I need to get this out there. Um, um, you know, I I see it as a congruent. Maybe because I've been part of the developmental process, I see it as a congruent whole. Um, that yeah, it's got three different parts, but they hang they hang together well. And, and and maybe it just needed that context, you know, from class so that a reader would have a, a framework in which to put the pieces in. Um, and in terms of number, well, in terms of audience, okay, that is a question, you know, usually asked of, a, of an author, what's the audience for the book? Um, and obviously the book isn't for everyone. Um, it's got a, you know, but but perhaps it's for more people than we than we realize, um, because it's one of the key pieces um, of of a, a major, you know, planetary issue that needs to be addressed. And the more people who might educate themselves about this, you know, here's a, here's a here's someone who has studied it. Here's an overview. Um, here's a way of looking at it. Here's a way of um, reaching different audiences. Yeah. Yeah. One one thing that strikes me real quick is how tiny book audiences are. Like when you compare a reasonably popular podcast or a blog post that goes a little bit viral or what have you in modern media, the number of humans whose brains are affected by those things is like really big, giant compared to 10,000 people, you know, most books don't get more than 10,000 sales. The, the, the vast majority of American books published do not make it beyond 10,000 people who purchase the book. And of those, God only knows how many of them actually read the book. Well, it's, it's very few. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's very, it's very few. Most books that are purchased are not read. Hmm. I can make that statement. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah. And unfortunately, I need to, I need to, I need to jump off. I've yeah. To... Thank you. Thank you for being here, Stuart. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Set up Substack. Substack. Hey, I think that was a really good, uh, good place to go. And uh, Substack is a good uh, palate cleanser after that as well. I just have one thing to add. I think one thing that needs to happen with the, so for me as reading it, that it struck out because maybe how I read is that there needs to be some copy editing on what the work you've already done with the conversations on chat GPT. And when I read it and when you make, you make a very strong claim about what several claims about what we really need to focus on and here, you know, here's how to do it. But in the part about the early parts there, I, as a reader, really wanted some citations and there aren't any. So, um, so there's just something that needs to be done with some of the material, I feel. You all may have different, uh, you know, want something else, but so, um, it's a good observation. Yep. Um, it may be time to use Questy. <laughs> so a very old and dear friend of Pete's and mine, uh, Dave Sifri, uh, who started Technorati back in the day and did a bunch of other stuff, has mm -hmm. started a little company called Questy.ai, which offers citations and fact checks itself before coughing things over to you. Um, and could, in fact, uh, aid in your journey, in your quest to have more backup for what you're saying. Although I think it cites to websites, probably, and not scientific journals. Although, I next time we talk to Dave, um, that would be a good... In a way, anything would be useful as long yeah. as for me as a reader, if I see a strong claim which is obviously a claim, not just, you know, here's what these paragraphs say. Yep. I mean, I would like to see, huh, how does he, where's the basis for making that kind of a claim? And there has been, because Klaus Hessinger has been dreaming, he's been reading, he's been doing all kinds of work, so there was a reason, you know, it came from somewhere. Even if you did generate it, there was still something that you, you know, learned from. So question. I think yeah. some of that... Yeah. It's it's not all that difficult. I mean, the dawn of everything comes to mind, right? Because I'm I'm using a lot of that information, and that's perfect. Just you know, to, you know, dawn of everything. You know, edition and page number or whatever. Fine, somebody can go find that, mm -hmm. right? And uh, probably get it from a public library because there seems to be plenty of them that have bought it. So I think that that would be helpful. Um. And I would just say, as a as a you know retired chemist, your claim that the climate models there's this big break between the climate models and what's going on with water and soil, it, it's somewhat more nuanced. Because I've been reading some in my atmospheric chemistry books and some other places, it's like I can see how that statement is true and i can also see how it's not like they don't you know know about it and the whole issue with water in air and stuff is like just um it also is a confusion thing it's complicated well it's not just climate it's very complicated as a physical system mm -hmm. yeah um in the in the, you know in the physical sciences it's a complicated and I even look back on the papers that were showed up in the OGM one from this uh, Russian woman who was talking about how, you know, there could be a lot more cooling and just it's, it has to do with water. And, well, climate people are pretty aware of mm -hmm. those effects. That so so. it's interesting that, you know, it's it's I think it's there's a strong claim to be made that it's possible that looking at things the way you're looking at in terms of soil and the health of soil and interaction of water 
there is certainly a piece about, well, we can just sequester the carbon, you know, we'll just plant mushrooms, it'll all be good. It's like, uh, no, here in Texas, we're going to build gas generators. And so, sorry, I don't think your mushrooms are going to help that much. We need something else. Not, 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 but not to say that there is this other piece about the soil, which I just came across. I'm reading a history of how economics actually became something different from natural philosophy. Hmm. And in the early enlightenment stuff, people were very aware that the only real wealth came from the earth. Before, so it's really, this is an idea that, you know, has been transmogrified in the kind of system we live in now, but it's, it has also been, um, it was also well and was understood in in some other ways, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago. So, Bill, you're opening a bunch of really interesting questions, some of which could get like really thorny and become these sort of downward looping spiraling, but we'll never figure this out. It's so complicated. And I think sometimes people have a perspective on a system where they see a lever or they see something that really sticks out and makes a lot of sense that other people haven't seen as much. And this feels like kind of the territory we're in. It's like, hey, this is over here. And Klaus, when you're making assertions like, hey, the climate, none of the climate analysts have seen the small water cycle, you better have some, some like reason to say that that's a really true thing or modify the statement to say, <laughs> the the role of the small water cycle is underappreciated or something like that. And when you leave the absolutes and enter the land of, hey, here's here's what we think is going on, or if you have a huge authority whom you're quoting and you want to point us to a webcast or a podcast interview of that person where they claim, where like they're clearly an authority in the, in the field and they claim it, and use that as evidence in, in the book, rock on then. Um, but you need to be cautious about claims like that. And then also this morning, my new more conservative than me friend sent me an article about straw, plastic straws versus uh, paper straws, how complicated that issue is. And I was like, boy, geez. Um, and uh, I really, I, I, had, I had a total mid Midwestern oy geez kind of response to it um, in the sense of all these issues will easily devolve into that. And yet, if we use, I'm sure it's not Occam's razor, but I don't think it's Hanlon's razor. Um, like, let the simplest thing kind of cut through. I think that is Occam's razor. The simplest, the simplest explanation is probably the right one. Is that Occam's razor? More or less. <laughs> More or less. But if we can sort of find find our way to making strong claims that are backable in some way, then the neo book format becomes a way to explore the nuances, the vagaries, the dilemmas, the everything else, but only if you set yourself up to jump into those things credibly at the beginning. So that's actually the only thing that I that I uh, highlighted. So, and I tried to transfer it over, but when you go into the document um, and you, you then you click on, there are indications. When you click on indications, um, then you get a search result that shows uh, a bunch of articles talking about uh, the, this this globally coherent water cycle response. Um, and the statement I'm making here that climate models seem to have missed uh, you know, the the uh, uh, importance of the small water cycle. So there's actually numerous articles uh, on the on the on the web that are that are linking to that. But anyway, I, I get the point of uh, um, putting references out there. Cool. Um, all of which has taken us away from building a Substack instance that Pete was going to take us into. Shall we do some of that? Um, how long do we have? Uh, 25 minutes until the top of the hour is our normal span. Wow, cool. Yeah, let's do Substack. Um, I I wanted uh, there's a um at some some point it would be fun to talk about uh production and publication process. Um, I we we've talked a couple times. I've talked a couple times about whether it's Markdown or HTML or restructured text or um or Google Docs or whatever. 
um, I, I realized that um, I had never really thought of prose fusion in this context, but prose fusion is, is kind of like massive wiki light, uh, massive wiki without the links kind of, but the idea is still to use Git and Markdown as the underlying. So, so anyway, I, I wonder how much, um, Um, in, in my perfect world, I guess we'd get something like uh, this Google Doc and we'd convert it to Markdown and put it in a, uh, probably in chapters in a Git repo um, and then and then go from there. So I posted earlier um, my own early thrashings on a NeoBooks production process. I put a link to the web page in the chat and I would love to build like that out as much as you wish. Like, but I, I, and it can move. But I just wanted to start that because I think that what you're saying makes a lot of uh, difference to whether we succeed or not. And then one of those is the project plan that you were pointing to in one of our recent calls as well. So we should flesh those things out. Yep. Um, cool. I, uh, so how does someone how does someone get to the right vault and repo from a web published web page automatically? If they if somebody saw one of those pages and wanted to edit it. On, I have, I have two answers, a clunky answer and a better answer. Uh -huh. The clunky answer, uh, on a massive wiki, you can generally scroll down to the bottom of the page and there's a link to the repo, the, the, okay. web, the home page of the repo. So massive pages um, should all have a link like that. Well, it depends on, on, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the theme. It's, uh, and, and it's up to the individual, whoever's publishing it. Um, the, the standard theme has, has that set up. Okay. Um, a slightly better answer is when you're reading documentation um, where people actually have a budget, <laughs> not that we can do this in Massive Wiki. Um, when you're reading documentation, there's a little uh, corner thing up at the top of the page that says edit this on, you know, edit this or correct this or comment on this. Um, even in Massive Wiki, we could have a little button somewhere that floats on top of the content. You, you click it and, you know, it pops open. Um, a thing could be on GitHub, could be someplace else. You know, uh, hi, you're talking about this page. Um, you know, type your comment here, or and then click to send it to the authors. So it's it's pretty easy to pretty easy. I mean, it, there's some development work there, but conceptually, it's very easy. It's doable. Yeah. Cool. Other thoughts before you dive in? Um. Substack, you can use custom domains, and there's a $50 one-time setup fee. Uh, we can postpone that, though, right? <laughs> Technically, yes. Um, I mean, market-wise, we... market uh, it's a question of, of your goals and, and resources. And I, I mean, we could start a discussion right now on what should we call this particular I... Substack, which is probably something we need to resolve because you need to fill it out on the form. Yeah, I and and maybe um, the customer domain is a weird place to start that from, but I guess it kind of comes down to that. Um, someday there will be uh, neobooks.openglobalbind.com or whatever, um, and that'll be the substack for OGM Neobooks. Um, uh, a different question is um, this: I, I think of this as one Neobook group. Uh, we could write up all the all the things that we do to do neobooks, and then some other uh, group in Japan or or um, uh, Swaziland or whatever could say, "Hey, we're going to do neobooks, except we're going to here's the way you know we do them almost the way they do it. We do it differently, and we're the Swaziland neobook uh, group. You know, um, that would be a super wonderful thing. So for this neobook group, do we want one Substack? Or do we want one substack per book? Or do we want one substack for all the climate soil books that we're working on? And then another book, another substack for all the social studies and psychology and you know books that we're working on or whatever. And the model that I was working with as we started talking about this was that the substack would sort of belong to the NeoBooks project and be attached to it, which means it would be a channel for any nugget generated by any incipient neo book 
And that would be kind of the boundary of it, and which would mean it would hop subjects. It wouldn't be a subject constrained substack. Um, and and uh, I would use hashtags for probably the book title and and the couple of the book subjects. Yeah. You know? And and direct links to where the project homepage would live. Um, so then we've talked previously. This this NeoBooks team uh, is the Open Global Mind NeoBooks team. So then and there's the Swaziland NeoBooks team, and that's a different substack. But everything I just said was just my conceit and the reason that how I was thinking about this. Totally happy to consider other ways of thinking about it, in, in, including. I mean, the thing I was thinking was like, Pete, you have substacks. And ghost and all that. What if there was a an Uber stack that in, that ate some of your other substacks because it made sense to flow those things all in the same stream? I'm not sure that's going to work, but but that's a possibility. Yep. Um, I like the way you you're thinking of it, Jay. And and you can have multiple accounts within one substack, right? Yes, multiple team members. Yeah. Multiple. Yeah. And and do they each have different passwords? So is is one password? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got uh, can sign in and and work on the publication. Yeah, how about I cover the fifty dollars setup fee? It's I Jerry's kind of right. Um, <laughs> the way he asked the question made me balk. Um, uh, we can totally have neobooks.substack.com right now for free. Um, if we want neobooks.openglobalmind.com. Um, I don't know if it's available. If if we want neobooks, I won't go to mine.com. That would be the fifty dollars. There's no reason to go there right now. So so neobooks.substack.com is available and works and is doesn't cost uh, anything else. If we want to point to it from a domain we own as a subdomain, then the fee kicks in, which is a thing I think we're going to hit. But I don't know. We need to solve that right right now. No. Does that make sense? So in this case, neobooks is like the publisher, right? Is that the matter? Yes. For yeah. Yeah, the, and and that, each book is still going to need its own marketing strategy, right? So you're still going to, like, Klaus, that's a, to me, though, like, the book is just a platform for you to go off and do other stuff, I think, right? And that's my experience watching other authors, too. So you're, you're still going to need a substack for your book, I think, right? Each book is going to have to have its own thing. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I You're totally right, David. And, and I think we're not so, quite sophisticated enough to do that yet. Well, but if an author is like, you know, like in Klaus's case, I mean, you're already out there as a, you know, as a spokesperson, you got, you've had these fantastic events that, you know, you're, you, they just kind of establish you as a thought leader. Um, and the book is a great excuse to get on a bunch of other podcasts and, you know, get into NPR stations and, you know, all kinds of things. But I think it's, that's why you do the book. Is we could that. turn this into unless a you want, business. Unless you're Jim Cash, in which case you do the book as, as tax deductions for your travel. But <laughs> I don't think so. But the, the, but it seems like that would work in 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 this setup where you have multiple channels, right, With, under one account. So is that is that correct? The, so the the architecture that Jerry described. Um, so Jerry's Jerry and Open Global Mind, um, and probably the kind of the NeoBooks team in in OGM, such as it is. The folks that come here, Stuart and and um, uh, and Stacy and Stacey. whoever, it's a NeoBooks team. Um, the NeoBooks team is thinking that it works on multiple books. You know, um, this month, this quarter is Klaus's uh, Neo Klaus's uh, book on climate and soil health, and and uh, and uh, you know, next uh, next it's going to be Stuart's book on conflict resolution, and next it's going to be et cetera, right? So Jerry is thinking there should be a NeoBooks substack um, where this week we're posting about uh, climate health and Klaus's book and Klaus's book number two coming up. And next week we're posting about Stuart's book on conflict resolution. So if you're subscribed to that, new, that, that thing, you see a bunch of stuff about different NeoBooks um, all related to OGM. So what Dave is saying is is very smart. Is like, eh, books are anymore are a a platform, a way to say, hey, look, this guy is also an author, uh, and a public speaker, and you know he knows a lot of stuff, um, and it, look, he's written this amazing book that's gotten great reviews. On so for that, in that concept, you'd want a separate sub just for that book. Um, 
uh, and maybe for the second book, maybe not. Um, so you would have a book. Um, I forget the name of this book, but you know, soil health, soil health with class mug or whatever dot substack dot com. Um, so and then and then every week, every day, you'd be posting. Hey, here's a tip about the small water cycle. Here's a tip about um, you know talking to people in the red you know red color group. Um, here's uh, a tidbit that's and here's a news item about um, you know Monsanto or uh, Bayer um, who's having trouble with uh, lawsuits you know et cetera et cetera. So a couple of thoughts to add in there. Um, two different thoughts maybe. One of them is some of the posts on this Substack will be meta neobooks posts about the process of neobooks and what neobooks are, and they will be like interspersed, intertwingled with actual nuggets that are meant to be part of books, right? And, and I think that will make it interesting and spicy and different from what it otherwise might be, which is just kind of a potpourri of chapter excer excerpts from very different books. So, so if, if, if we start posting sort of loyally to it as, hey, this is, this is the Neobook's journey and this is where it's gonna go. And, and you know, I think that, that could get like really interesting and pick up some, some more interest. And then the second thing is, um, at some point, Klaus, if you wanted to, you could start your own Substack for the for the book. But then you'd have to maintain a Substack, and by banding together, no, no one of us has to pull the freight of publishing regularly on a schedule to do a Substack. But rather, we can count on a bunch of different activities feeding a stream that is big enough and interesting enough uh, to sort of uh, suit people, as long as it's not too confusing to the people receiving it at the other end. And then, third thought, maybe I'll add is. Um, Klaus, what this gives you easily is URLs that live in the world that you can point people to. And it sort of doesn't matter what the wrapper was around around that. There's that there's a post out there that you can say, hey, this is really important. Go look at this. Right. And I and I like that a lot about this arrangement and about using Substack to do this, is that in the end, there's a permalink you can share with people that that takes them to a particular spot. Yeah, that seems to work. It's it's not either or either um so or? if there's a neobooks one um uh at, at some point klaus or more likely his social media manager could be writing the post that goes on to both of those sub stacks and just cross post um, yeah yep. so that that's what you would end up doing yeah and then she would also post it to instagram and tiktok and and take, and take send advantage out a press release and, and take advantage of all the fan outs yeah and all the distribution lists Cool. Um, thanks. I got one question about the Substack thing. Please. Are we going to uh, have uh, chats and notes? Yes. Are we going to use those? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. See? So I want... We'll, we'll delegate it to the, uh, the um, public relations manager for new books. Sure. Yeah. GPT, GPT chat. I kept my face straight. You did <laughs> somehow. <laughs> um, I just, I, I know I like the the notes, but I have found in some of the such stacks I'm on that people ask for comments, and when you make comments, it's like nothing ever happens. So it's like let's have a conversation, but no conversation happens. Well, some so stack has that feature. Is that something we can turn on and off? Yeah, I think so. Well, I certainly I think can because not all Substacks don't all have notes. Some right. of them say, "Hey, I've just started," but it's interesting. But it, you know, it's like Pete says, none of the, if you want to be out in the world and use these tools to engage people, and they want to be engaged, you got to be there to be engaged with. So, That's very engaging. Well, um, you know. So that kind of means that we're agreeing to show up when people make comments on the nuggets that matter to us. If we do notes and chats. Yes. Maybe if, a different I mean, way to say that is we should we should not have notes and chats until we agree to staff them. <laughs> a third a third way to say that, and this is not generating any reactions from uh, my OS. A third way to think about that is to turn off the Substack feature for notes and chat, maybe, um, and then say, hey, if you'd like to talk about this, come back to the wiki and then sort out 
how the conversation could happen around the wiki page. But what we really want is a thriving conversation around the wiki page. We just don't have all the all the bits and bits and bobs in place to do that properly. Yes, no. That's the uh, I I like the gen the general generalization of it. Um, that's the worst of all possible worlds. I know, I know, because then we the... get no chat at all. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, love, the, I love the the utopian perspective of that. Yeah, it's like we've got, we've got, got so much that's conversation what, that's going what, exactly. on. <laughs> so we're overwhelmed. We have to go to the wiki. Right. Oh my oh, god, yeah. people love this stuff. Thanks. Oh, so you like to make a comment? Okay, now download Obsidian and then install the Git plugin, and then all that to post a picture of a pretty Asian woman. Yes, <laughs> an um, AI generated one. So Pete, we are rapidly running out of time on this call to Indeed. do the thing we thought we were going to get done. Um, in the background, I am. Let's uh, so let's do it. Do you I want a screen share? I will screen share. Very cool. Thanks. We'll see what will happen. Um, so I think what we've learned is that uh, we'll create the Substack uh, with the OGM admin account, and then everybody will get a, an individual. Any, anybody who wants one will get an individual. Uh, account of their own invited to it um sounds great and so oh create an account first no <laughs> no see it, I, by the way <laughs> yeah, subscribe right. to seven and continue it needs you to subscribe to seven right if oh i'm i thankfully it checked them for me uh so oh, you I have to uncheck these yeah uns, uh, uns, uh oh wow I can't unselect all, but I can. Select I think you all. could at the top. It was like I think there was a way to, at one point. <clears throat> uh, right. Sounds good. And um, is the handle what's going to be visible to the outside world, or? I believe so. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So this should be open global mind, right? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I don't know how they're going to feel about a URL in here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, give it a try. Uh, we'll come back and fix this later. Yep. Oh my God! Wow. Cool. Uh, nope. Engagement, engagement, engagement. Yeah. So <laughs> I had for invite friends. Uh, unless sorry. you want to decorate. Unless we want to decorate. Yeah. We continue. Open global mind. So this should is new books. I think it should be Neobooks. I don't think this is a broader OGM substack, although I'm easily convinced otherwise. But I, I like this being a focused Neobooks project E substack. So the the handle known as Open Global Mind is not going to be able to make an open global mind that substack, which is probably okay. Yeah. Oh, because you can only do one substack per email? No, you can do. Yeah, that's true. You're totally right. Um, I I selected neobooks dot there. It's that's better than neobook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Massive email list, I presume. Uh, good. Let's skip that for now. I don't think we have any. Um, and we want to add authors or subscribers. Uh, this is subscribers. Yeah. Uh, I'll just do us for now. Uh, I'll skip for now. Let's do this. We have a Substack. Oh my god! Wow. Um, okay, so Jerry and I have the this admin um, username and password, and we're probably not going to use it very much. So yeah. I'm going to settings. I will. I will else. sign in as myself on my regular browser, also here. So I won't come in as the uh, admin. I don't think. Um. I'm going to make this into Neo Books. You know the capital B, please? Sorry. Uh, copyright open, yeah, open global mind. Yep. 
Um, I'm glad I got to this part, but this is not mm. what I was expecting here. Mm -hmm. Team, here's what I was expecting. Good. Uh, cool. Wow, uh, this uh, scrolling is hinky here. Hmm. Um, Which other emails do you guys want I to have on here? I think I, what I would suggest is for us to kick the tires, Jerry, and then, well, either yeah. way. Bill, do you want to help kick the tires, or do you want to be invited later? Well, I'm just putting down the test now. Cool. Dave and Klaus will, you know, we'll we'll dress up the the windows and put some carpet down, and then uh, invite you in. Does that make sense? Good. Uh, so now I will go try to accept the invite in another window. You've been invited to become a member of Open's it's Substack. Exciting. I love funny. how we had Open Global Mind as, as its name, so now it's it's calling it Open. Hi, yeah. Open. <laughs> nice to see you, Open. I haven't had that happen before. Okay. It's good. It's I like good. It. <clears throat> I like it. So, so Peter is now private. This grayed out thing is not working for me. It freaks me out. Hmm. Um, it's going to be public. And he's going to be an admin. I've been invited as well. I'm accepting now. <laughs> cool. I presume you're public? Yeah. And I presume you're admin? Yep. Thank you. Bill, let me know when you accept and I can. Yeah, I got to do it. We have some dog to the groomer thing coming up in a little bit. So I um, don't want to get too involved just, in that yeah, stuff. Just yeah. wait for another time. Um, I think we're we're set. Yeah. As Jerry said, uh, now we need some more decoration and set decoration and uh, stuff. But Sounds great. Good progress. Feels really good. And, I'm, and are we more or less together on the, like, what this channel is about and what's going to go through it? I think so. I would okay. I would love to see that written up somewhere. Else. Yeah. Um, so Neobooks documents are in the Neobooks folder on the OGM wiki. I, I Correct. Think. Yes. So the, the OGM wiki is currently the place where I'm writing anything about Neobooks, um, in, including a, a very nascent draft of my own Neobook. So cool. Yep. And what I'll do, I think what I'll do, is that I'll put up project pages for Klaus uh, and Stuart and Rick, uh, who I think all would like to play with the idea of publishing a neobook, um, so that when each of you posts, you can you know add that link and we can sort of keep that page updated. So anybody who wants to know, hey, Klaus, what's up with this book writing project you have? You'll have a URL that you can give people. Um, that could work. So. Unless you think there's a, a, a better, different way, but I think that I think that'll be beneficial, and it'll help straighten out what's where. Um, and Klaus, you can say no, but I I think one of the main pipelines for NeoBooks is going to be the Markdown GitHub thing. Um, is it okay if I take your book, turn it into Markdown, and stick it in GitHub? I would wait a while to do that until we've really? got. I I think what I think Bill's comments and and stuff need to turn into a little bit a, a tiny another pass, and that's just me. But I I it's like as soon as you want to share anything of it, I think you want the whole thing repoized. No, uh, but but I'm just saying discussion. that once it once it's repoized, it's out of sync, and any changes Klaus makes are not going to get reflected easily. I I so I wouldn't suggest it if I thought that Klaus would still be making changes. Um, I I understood but, Klaus to be kind of done and. Let okay. me do let me do one more round of changes based on the conversation today. I mean, first of okay. all, I think I'm going to frame 
what I just explained earlier, these, these three books in our pieces and tie this together. So maybe I'm putting an introduction that contextualizes, you know, how this is supposed to flow. And then let me see if I can put in some um, some links to supporting articles. In a couple hours, I will be uploading this call's transcript and video and all that as I usually do. So if you want, go into the transcript and just look for that stretch where you explained it and start from there if you want. Um, that'll it's there. Yeah, yeah, that was ad hoc. So <laughs> ad hoc is good. Sometimes it works well. That's that's why we have the recording and the transcript. Yeah. So we have our hawks. That sounds good. And it is starting to pour down rain now here in Portland. What's rain? Oh, I'm sorry. in Nashville with my with my daughter and her three granddaughters. You no, know, she just made it out of Tel Aviv. They were in the middle of uh, uh, this mess when when the conflict started. I mean, mm -hmm. that was, that was uh, something else to track her getting on a plane. I mean, finding and finding an exit point. You know. Incredible stuff. That's, that's crazy. Glad she's glad she's here. Yep. Well, I'm here in the middle of this Israeli community because she married you know, a boy from Tel Aviv. And uh, you, know, you talk, I met a couple of her friends yesterday and they both had brothers in the war. You know, you can imagine how emotional that all is. Wow. Crazy world. It is. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks all. More soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. -bye. Bye. Yeah.